All right, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> now, if you'd open your Bible to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. <clears throat> this morning we're going to be in verses 19 to 21, verse 24, and verse 26. Uh, this is part two of a series uh, that I began last week, just a two-part series called The Works of the Flesh. I'll take that title directly from the uh, text this morning, where Paul lists out 15 works of the flesh and... Um, I want to encourage you, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, I, I know this, the sermon this morning is about works of the flesh, and it's not something that we preach on or I preach on frequently. It, um, this is, we value going through God's Word, every verse. Every verse is the inspired Word of God, and so we want to cover every verse that God has given us. So um, if you uh, weren't here last week and you missed part one, you can catch it online on our YouTube channel. Um, so let's... Um, Read the text, I'll open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Galatians chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 19, Paul writes, <clears throat> Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then down in verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I pray as we just sang um, that the Spirit, your Holy Spirit, God, you would send forth uh, to come and stir us, Lord. God, I thank you that there are brothers and sisters in this room who have the Spirit of God living inside of them. And as a result, Lord, that uh, you are among us, you are with us, you are for us as we just sang. And I pray that you would help us to uh, enjoy that now as we listen um, to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the aim this morning is twofold. Uh, number one, my, my aim is to draw a mental picture in your mind of two paths. The path of the spirit and the path of the flesh. And two, is to warn you, as I warn myself, of the dangers of the path of the flesh and to invite you to experience the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore on the path of the Spirit. That's my aim this morning. Last week I began a two-week series called The Works of the Flesh. That comes directly from our text in verses 19 to 21, where Paul lists a total of 15 works of the flesh. And we looked at some of those last week. I, have, I had divided them into four categories. Uh, category one was sins of immorality. There was three of these, uh, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Category two is sins of idolatry, which is idolatry and sorcery. Category three, which is what we're going to look at this morning, the sins of relationship, eight of these. Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalry, dissensions, divisions, and envy. And the category four, which we looked at last week, was the sins of intemperance, drunkenness, and orgies, or probably better translated, carousing. Last week we looked at one, two, and four, total of seven. Today we're going to look at category three only because there's a total of eight of these, eight works of the flesh. And the structure of last week is the structure this morning, same structure. I want to start off by giving you theological foundations, kind of theological principles, things to keep in mind as we go through this list. And then we'll look at the works of the flesh. What are they? Why are they a work of the flesh? And then we'll talk about walking in the Spirit, how walking in the Spirit enables us to not gratify the works of the flesh, how that's the key, to walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
So that's where we're going. Theological foundations. I gave you four last week. I'll give them again to you at just as a refreshment. Uh, number one, because these, these are all true. These all apply today as well. Number one, the works of the flesh are evident. They are or obvious. Two, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. This list of works of the flesh is not exhaustive. Three, works of the flesh do not define and or identify Christians, but the lost. And four, this list that Paul gives us is given as a warning. Paul says, I warn you. It's given as a warning. Today, I'm going to give you five. I know last week I told you before. I added one. It'll be five this morning. So let's jump into theological foundations. Number one, the word do should be translated make a practice of doing. Look at verse 21. Paul says, those who do such things. Now, the ESV puts a footnote there. You might have a footnote in your Bible if you have the ESV. And that footnote in the ESV is make a practice of doing. The, uh, why do they put that footnote there? Because the Greek word for do is a present active participle. Well, what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that this is not just a one-time action. This is why most translations, the NASB, the NET, the CSB, ISV, New King James, most translations translate it as those who practice such things. The word do can be misleading because it can leave the impression that if you get angry one time, those who get angry will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, man, I get angry every day. So what does that mean? Those who practice such things. It's not the, the doing of one time, but the unrepentant practice of doing. That's what Paul means there. Now, if you're wondering, as I suspect some of you may be, how often do I have to do these things to be considered making a practice of them? Let me exhort you, that's the wrong question. That's the wrong question. We don't go to our boss and we say, what's the bare minimum I can do and not be fired? Or if we're flying in an airplane, I don't want a company that says in, the, in their board meetings, what's the bare minimum we can do and this plane still fly? Those are the wrong questions. Likewise, the question is never, at what point, pastor, Am I considered to be making a practice of it? That's the wrong question. The better question is always, do I love what God loves? And do I hate what God hates? That's the, the better question. Do I love what God loves and do I hate what God hates? Number two, those who make a practice of doing the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Where do I get this from? Directly from verse 21. Verse 21. Paul says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do or those who make a practice of doing such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> to be blunt and to, to, to take Paul's words and the fullness of their bluntness, Paul is saying that those who make a practice of these works, make an unrepentant practice of these works, they will be damned to hell. This is a stern, but a loving warning given by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Now, this is not the only time that Paul, make, <clears throat> Paul makes such a statement. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, Paul says, Or you do not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And Paul repeats that same idea in Ephesians 5.5. 5. That leads to number three. It is not the practicing that invalidates the salvation of but the practicing gives evidence to the lack of salvation. Let me say that again. It is not the practicing that invalidates the salvation. It is 
the practicing that gives evidence to the lack of salvation. In other words, Paul is not saying that there is a category where there are genuine, born-again Christians who are genuinely saved, and then they fall into this practice of sin, and that practice of sin invalidates their salvation. Paul's, that's, that's not what Paul's saying. No, Paul is saying that those who make a practice of sin i.e. those who practice sin and they don't repent of their sin and they, they give evidence that they are in fact not saved. Repentance is not a one and done. Meaning repentance is not what we do when we get saved. Repentance is what we do every day of our life. It is something that will be practiced by all who are in Christ. If you are in Christ, you will make a practice of repentance. The reality is we all have a choice. We can be defined by making a practice of sinning, or we can be defined by making a practice of repenting. And repentance does mean, repentance is not less than contrition, but it is certainly more than contrition. Repentance is not just being contrite over sin and just continuously sinning over and over and over again. And then you say, well, every time I feel bad for it. No, repentance means at some point you have to stop. Or stop, cease it less, more. John writes, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning no one born of god makes a practice of sinning for god's seed abides in him he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of god now you can read that passage and begin to condemn yourself you can read that passage and begin to think man who is saved everybody i know makes a practice of sinning you have to be careful here. There's a difference between making a practice of sinning, unrepentantly making a practice of sinning, and every day waking up, repenting, and striving to not walk in sin. I'll never forget a story told by John Piper. Uh, you know, John Piper has influenced me more than anybody in my life, I believe, other than Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father. I'll never forget the story. I, I will remember this to the day I die, I believe. Um, he told the story. He was teaching on perseverance of the saints. He said in 1980, uh, he was a brand new pastor at the church he, he used to pastor. And there was a woman uh, who was having an affair on her husband. She came into his office and, and he knew about it and uh, he was talking to her. And um, he said, okay, that stops today. And she said, ah, I don't know. I, he's like, no, 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 you don't, that stops today. And she's like, ah, yeah. Ah. And he says, let, let me be very clear. If you don't stop this, you will go to hell. Now some of you are wondering, is that true? It is true. You have to follow the logic of the statement. The adultery is not what would send her to hell. She wouldn't go to hell because she committed adultery. The unrepentant adultery would give evidence to the fact that the Spirit of God was not in her. It would give evidence to the fact that she was not in Christ. Four. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh 
Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. Look at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And that word, have crucified, that's one word in the Greek there. It's an aorist, active, indicative. Well, what does that mean? Well, aorist means it's past. That's the Greek tense for past. It means it's done. It's finished. Active means that Jesus was crucified for us, but it's not a third-party crucifixion. It's not something that we say, thank you, Jesus, for being crucified for us, and that's it. No, there's an active here, meaning I must be crucified with him. I have been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. And then indicative, it's the mood of reality, meaning this is true. This is real. This is a real thing. Matt has been crucified with Christ. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We are not slaves of our flesh. We are not. Brothers and sisters, we are not slaves to pornography. We are free. We are not slaves to our phone. We are free. We are not slaves to our anger. We're not slaves to performance. We are not slaves to any of the works of the flesh or anything under heaven. We are slaves to one master and one master only. We are slaves to Jesus Christ. And slavery to him is freedom. It is joy. I say that because let me encourage you, the next time you sin, Satan is whispering in your ear saying, you can't help it. You, you, listen, this is, this is your thorn in the flesh. Pornography is your thorn in the flesh. Anger is your thorn in the flesh. Your phone is your thorn in the flesh. Like, you, you, you can't help it. You know, just, just manage it. Manage it. Let me encourage you, brother and sister, you are not a slave to anything other than Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are free. And the beauty of the cross is that Jesus doesn't just change our actions. That's the beauty of this. He doesn't just change our actions. He actually changes our desires and our passions. Look at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, not only the flesh, but also its passions and its desires. Meaning that when we walk by the Spirit, not only will we not gratify the flesh, we don't want to gratify the flesh. That's the beauty of Christianity, is that not only do we not sin, that Jesus changes it. We don't want to. Now sometimes, yeah, we're still sinful, and sometimes we do want to. But it's, it's a temporary wanting. It's not a life wanting. As a, as a life, I don't want to do this. You don't want to do this if you are in Christ. Five. Lastly, we still wrestle with the flesh and we must put to death the flesh. Even though we have been crucified, he says right here that we've been crucified with his passions and desires. Even though that's true, we still wrestle. There's coming a day where we will not wrestle anymore. Praise God. But for now, we still do. We still wrestle with the flesh. We must still put the deed to death the deeds of the flesh. That's why Paul can write verse 24 and then write verse 26, two verses later. He says in verse 24, you have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. And then two verses later, he says, don't become conceited. Don't provoke one another. Don't envy one another. And you're like, well, why would you tell, tell us that if we've crucified the flesh? Because we still wrestle with the flesh. 
conceit and provoking and envy will still creep into the heart of a believer. But praise God, they won't stay there. None of the works of the flesh will stay in your heart if you are in Christ. The Spirit of God will run them out like a, with a Mack truck. Over time. Works of the flesh. Eight of these. With each of these, I'm going to give a definition where it's used in the New Testament and why it's a work of the flesh. Um, so let's talk about these. Category three, sins of relationship. Eight of these. Let's look at these. You can see them in your text there. First one is enmity. Enmity. That's not a word we really use. I don't know that I've ever heard that word in a, in a conversation by myself or anybody else. What is, so what is enmity? Enmity is being an enemy of someone. Hostility, antagonism. It's used six times in the New Testament, but the variant, which is very close to almost the exact word, is enemy. The word for enemy is, 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 is a variant of this word enmity, and that word's used 32 times. Romans 8, 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, or is at enmity with God. James 4, 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? So why is it a work of the flesh? Two reasons. Number one is that there is enmity between us and God, and then there's enmity between us and our neighbor or our brother and sister or whoever. Number one, our enmity between us and God, Romans 8, 7 to 8, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Jesus said that no one can serve God two masters you will either love the one and hate the other or you will love the other and hate the one you cannot have more than one master and paul says that the spirit is opposed to the flesh the sp i preached on this a few weeks ago the spirit and the flesh they are enemies they are at enmity to each other. The spirit and the flesh are at enmity to one another. They are opposed to each other. And so if we decide, if we want to walk in the flesh, well, God opposes the proud. Two. Ephesians 2, 14 and 16, our enmity between one another. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. A week from tomorrow is uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Kind of a, a national holiday where we celebrate uh, the work that Martin Luther King did and, and trying to bridge the racial gap here. In America, not just between black and white, but of all ethnic, ethnicities and races and cultures and backgrounds. But the reality is, is that the walls that divided Jew and Gentile 2,000 years ago, those exact same walls still exist today. Race, culture, gender, education, background, socioeconomic status, these are all walls that divide us and they are all works of the flesh and paul says christ died to tear down those walls he he died to tear down the wall of hostility between us to reconcile us to god and our neighbor it god does not just want to reconcile us to him he wants to reconcile us to each other so that your neighbor, that maybe you don't like all that much for one reason or another, you would be reconciled to him or her. Strife. What's the definition? Engagement and rivalry, especially with reference to positions taken in a matter, strife, discord, contention. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used nine times. It occurs in six of the relationship vice lists. Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. 
He says, For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. That word quarreling is the same word for strife. And you remember um, what was going on there? They were having strife. What were they fighting about? They're fighting about who was a better apostle. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. I like Jeffrey's worship. I like Frank's worship. I like Tim's preaching. I like Ivan's preaching. Why is it a work of the flesh? Why, Titus 3, 9, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Unprofitable and worthless. Now, we might look to the Corinthians, we might laugh at, you know, that, that, that they were fighting over who was a better apostle, Apollos or Cephas, or you think that that's silly to fight over that. But aren't all fights silly and worthless? Almost all of them. How many times do we hear, like, I hear married couples or, like, dating couples or friends, you know, like, what were you fighting about? I was something silly, like, how to put the toaster in the toaster correctly. You know? My parents used to fight over how to load the dishwasher correctly. I mean, it was just... Uh, Paul says that most strife is, is unprofitable and worthless. And we all know that. Jealousy, definition, the word is zelos. It's where we get the word zeal from. There's a positive use and a negative use of the word. I want to make sure we understand that zeal can be positive or negative. There's intense, positive interest in something. Zeal, ardor, marked by a sense of dedication. And then there's intense negative feelings over another's achievement or success. Jealousy, envy. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used 16 times, but the variants are used another 23 times. The positive use of this word, remember John 2, 17, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus is passionate for the purity of the temple. And so he goes and flips their tables. That was a good zeal. Paul talks about the Corinthian zeal. He says, your zeal for me. That was a good zeal. He says, your zeal has stirred up most of them, meaning the churches at Macedonia have been stirred up because of the Corinthians zeal for generosity. And then even Paul talks about his own jealousy in a good sense. He says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. There's even a good jealousy among us. But then there's a negative use. The Sadducees were filled with jealousy and they arrested the apostles and they put them in public prison. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were motivated by jealousy. They loved power. They loved the praise of man. And they couldn't stand anybody else getting it. Why is it a work of the flesh? Well, first, let's be clear that not all jealousy is a work of the flesh. It, there is a righteous jealousy. God's jealousy over us. God is jealous for us. And that is a good thing. Praise God that he's jealous for us because I don't think we'd make it if he wasn't. A husband's jealousy for his wife. I'm jealous for Lauren. And if you try to encroach, you'll be met with words. Maybe more. Because I'm jealous for her. A shepherd's jealousy or even a discipler's jealousy. Guys, if you're discipling a guy, uh, another guy or girls, if you're discipling another girl, there should be a healthy level of jealousy for them, not for yourself, but for God. That if I'm discipling Jim and I see that the world is coming to take him away, I am jealous for Jim because he is Christ. And I don't want him to be shared with anybody other than Christ. That's what Paul says when he says he feels a divine jealousy. So there is a righteous jealousy, but almost all jealousy outside of that is unrighteous. Almost all of it. 
It's usually a work of the flesh. James 3, 14 to 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. James writes that jealousy is unspiritual, earthly, and demonic. Now you might think, is that being a little dramatic, James? I don't think it is. Why? Remember Cain and Abel? The first murder. The first murder in the history of the world was rooted in jealousy. Joseph and his brothers. The first kidnapping and selling into slavery that we know of was rooted in jealousy. Rachel and Leah, we've been looking at that in Sunday school. They start some sister pregnancy contest. And it's rooted in jealousy. Saul and David, the first king of Israel, is rejected in part because of his jealousy. He couldn't stand that the women were singing that he had killed thousands, but David had killed tens of thousands. It drove him insane, and he attempts to murder David. Even the psalmist, remember the psalmist? I preached on this last year or two years ago. I was envious of the wicked. He says, my feet almost slipped. What he means is that, look, I almost gave up on God. I looked around and I saw all the wicked prospering and I said, I, I would like that. And he said, I almost slipped. I almost walked away from God. But then I remembered what the end was. I remembered that they would be judged. Anger. Definition, a state of intense displeasure, anger, wrath, rage, indignation. Now, this is not the normal Greek word for anger. That's why your translation, if you have something different than ESV, has something different there, probably. Uh, some translations do outburst of anger. Some use fits of rage. Some use outburst of wrath. It's not the normal word for anger. Where is it used? It's used 18 times, but 10 of those 18 are used in Revelation. It's the word that's used to refer to the wrath of God in Revelation. Why is it a work of the flesh? Well, using a different word for anger. So let me be clear, this is not the same word, but this is the normal word for anger. Paul writes to the Ephesians, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. But then, five verses later, Paul writes, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. I used to read that and think, Paul, you said be angry and don't sin, and then you said put it all away. What, what, what does that mean, Paul? I think there's two reasons. Number one, in between those two verses, Paul says this, Give no opportunity for the devil. What does that mean? In other words, anger is not a very controllable emotion. In fact, we all know that it's barely a controllable emotion. The odds of actually fulfilling Ephesians 4.26, the odds of actually being angry and not sinning are very slim. The odds of giving an opportunity to the devil are not slim. Meaning that when you get angry, it's like opening the front door to Satan. It is. So Paul says it's best to put it all away. Close the door. Second reason, James 2 uh, James 1, 19 to 20, let every person be slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I remember my last year at seminary, um, I got into, I, I had to take a bunch of counseling courses because I, I needed electives. I saved my electives to the end, and then I didn't get to take any Bible electives. I had to take all counseling electives. 
uh, which was not what I wanted to do. It's not biblical counseling, but um, I actually got into a fight with, with one of my counseling professors um, because she was telling the class that, they sh that um, anger was good and right and they should embrace it and, and it, it's valid. And, and I raised my hand and I said, oh, hold, hold on. Like James says that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And, and, and we got into a heated debate and, and, and we probably both got angry. Uh, <laughs> let's be clear, there is such a thing as righteous anger. There is such a thing as righteous anger, but here's the thing, a righteous person will be slow to anger. Because the, why? Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me just say as a side note here, okay? Um, because here, here there, there's two extremes when it comes to anger. And I, I, I'm usually on one end, and the majority of you, not all of you, but the majority of you are on the other end. Here are the two extremes. There's easily angered, and there's impossible to anger. <coughs> Those are both extremes. James says, be slow to anger not impossible to anger. Sin should anger you. It should. Just be careful. You can easily turn to sin. Rivalry. Definition, selfishness or selfish ambition. A feeling of resentfulness based upon jealousy and implying rivalry. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used seven times. Uh, Romans 2, 8. But those who are self-seeking, that word for self-seeking is the same word there for rivalry. Why is it a work of the flesh? Same reason for jealousy. Same exact reason. Because the same word occurs in James 3, 14 to 16. Rivalry is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. He says it's where there's rivalry, there'll be disorder and every vile practice. It's like Wall Street and Silicon Valley in a nutshell. I mean, isn't that what Wall Street's based on and what Silicon Valley's based on? Dog eat dog, right? You do whatever it takes to get ahead. You got to lie, cheat, steal. That, 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 that's what life is. And Paul says that's not what we are to be as Christians. One other reason he gives is Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition. That word selfish ambition, same word as rivalry here. Do nothing from rivalry or selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I, yeah, I read that every time, and, I, and it, that is like one of the hardest verses in the Bible. I'm like, wait a minute. Count others as more significant, as more important. And my immediate mind in my flesh says, well, what if they're not more important? <laughs> Paul says, the Holy Spirit says, count them as more important. Count them as more important. Count them as more significant. I'm humble when, that, when I consider Jesus who is the king of the universe. He is the king. If he can wash the feet that he created, I can certainly count others as more significant than myself. Dissensions. Definition, the state of being in factious opposition. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's only used twice in the New Testament. Here in Romans 16, 17. Why is it a work of the flesh? Well, in that passage in Romans 16, 17, Paul says, Paul writes, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create dissensions and obstacles contrary to the teaching you learned. Avoid them. For these are the kind who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own appetites. Those who create dissensions do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites appetites. Now, as a side note, what I find ironic and kind of humorous is that, notice what Paul says here, those who create dissensions, avoid them. Meaning, dissent 
from those who create dissensions. Dissensions are bad in as much as it deviates from the teaching that you have learned. That's what Paul says there. They create dissensions that deviate from the teaching that you have learned. Next, divisions. Very similar to dissensions. What is the definition here? A division of people in different and opposing sect, sets. Division, separate group. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used nine times. Frequently used in the book of Acts. The party of the Pharisees, the party of the Sadducees, sect of the Nazarenes. That, that word party and sect, that's the same word there. Why is it a work of the flesh? Again, divisions can have a positive usage. Let me, let me be clear that as Christians, our goal is not to avoid division and dissension at all cost. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, For there must in fact be divisions among you. Why? So that those of you who are approved may be evident. May be evident. Jesus says, do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? Which is funny because earlier he had said he did come to bring peace. He says, my peace I give you. And then other times he says, do you think I came to give you peace? No, I did not come to give you peace. I came to bring you division. There is a division between the lost world and the church. Guys, if you live the Christian life, some of you, you and your parents will be divided. You will. You might even be divided with your spouse. And that division is necessary. Paul says, therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them. But this is not the kind of division that Paul's referring to here. Let's be clear about that. That kind of division is not what Paul's referring to here in Galatians 5. The type of division that he's referring to here is the division that would creep into the church among believers. Division like Corinth, the division that existed when those who said, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, and they were divided over this. That's the kind of division. And Paul says to young Titus, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once, after warning him twice, have nothing more to do with him. That's very dogmatic. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. You know, as a parent, there are a few things that grieve my heart more than to see my kids fighting. They know this. I see them fighting with each other. It's one thing if it's like normal, like, like everybody fights kind of kids among kids, but it's one thing when they're like fighting like out of malice and hate. There's very few things that grieve my heart more than that. As a pastor, I don't know uh, of anything necessarily that grieves my heart more than when I know that there are two members in the church that are divided. They're not talking to each other. They avoid each other. They might even stir up conflict. I think the same is true for God. Envy. Last one. It's very similar to jealousy. A state of ill will towards someone because of real or presumed advantage experienced by such a person. Where is it used in the New Testament? It's used nine times. The verb is used in verse 26. Down here in verse 26 where he says, let us not envy one another. That's the verb form of the noun here. Jesus says in Matthew 20, uh, um, sorry, Matthew writes in Matthew 27 that Pilate realized that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered Jesus up. They envied Jesus and the, the power that he had and the influence that he had, and that was why they delivered him up. Why is it a work of the flesh? Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves of various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. Notice what he's there. He connects these sins with slavery. 
Anybody who has ever envied somebody else, you know and I know good and well that envy is not only the chains of the slave, it is the very lock on the chain. You ever envy somebody? Wanted what they had? It's slavery. I know it because I wrestle with it. John Chrysostom said, As a moth gnaws a garment, so doth envy consume a man. Unlike the moth, though, envy eats you from the inside out. So that's all 15 works of the flesh. Now, over two weeks, eight today, seven last week. Now, how does walking in the Spirit enable us to not gratify the desires of the flesh? How does walking in the Spirit... This is the most important part of the sermon. Everything else is just so we all are clear what we're talking about. And uh, going back to what I said at the beginning, let me make sure you kind of wonder, like, why'd you give us all this information, Matt? Uh, let me be clear. Those two paths that I mentioned at the beginning, the path of the flesh and the path of the spirit, it's not like they have a road sign on them that says, Here's the path of the flesh. Here's the path of the spirit. They often look very similar. My goal in giving you this information is that you would have clear understanding of this is the path that leads to hell. And this is the path that leads to life. So you would, you would know very, very clearly what the two paths are. Now, the question is, how does walking in the Spirit enable us to not walk the path of the flesh, but to walk the path of the Spirit? How does that work? There are many ways to answer that question. Many, many ways. I'll give you one, and I think it's one of the main ones. Maybe the, the main one. Walking by the Spirit, in part, is to wield the weapon of the Spirit. What is the weapon of the Spirit? The sword of the Spirit. Paul writes, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We each have 10,000 scabbards in our mind and heart. You guys know what a scabbard is, right? No, you don't. I asked my wife. She didn't know. Uh, Jay, what's a scabbard? what you put a sword in here's a scabbard or you might call it a sheath it's what you put a sword in all of us have 10,000 mental emotional scabbards in our mind and our heart and the question is what are you filling those with are they empty Are they empty? Paul encourages us that the way to gratify, to not gratify the desires of the flesh is to fill those scabbards with the Word of God. To be filled with the Spirit is to arm ourselves for battle. And this is our primary weapon. This is our primary weapon. Tomorrow, my neighbor, my boss, my coworker, maybe somebody at church, maybe my wife, maybe one of you, will do something that will hurt me, wound me, offend me, anger me. And the way to not respond with enmity and strife is to walk by the Spirit, to take up the sword of the Spirit so that when I am tempted, 
to be hostile to them that says, I'm not talking to them anymore. I'm not going to forgive them. When I am tempted to be hostile to them, I pull out the sword of Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive, Matt. And in my mind, I preach that to myself. Because I'm tempted to say, I don't want to forgive you. You're not worth forgiving. You don't deserve forgiving. And I preach to myself, Colossians 3.13, and I slay that temptation. Tomorrow I'm going to see my rich neighbor. Went driving in Medina a couple, a couple years ago. That was a mistake. Uh, you see his, hot, ni- you know, his nice house, nice car, living the dream. Or maybe tomorrow my co-worker's going to get promoted above me. Maybe the girl that I've liked for three years gets swept up by another man. Hey, that, that, was, that was mine. I was, I was going to talk to her. Or somebody else gets praise that I thought I deserved. I did that. I wrote that code. And the way to not respond with jealousy, rivalry, envy, is to walk by the Spirit. Take up the sword of the Spirit so that rather than letting jealousy and envy and rivalry mildew in my heart, and that's what it will do. It will sit in your heart and mildew your heart. Rather than that, I will pull out the sword of 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. I will pull out the sword of Proverbs 14.30. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And I will pull that sword out and I will preach it to myself and I will slay that temptation and I will walk by the Spirit. Tomorrow my wife is going to anger me and she knows this. It's, it's probably my fault. The driver in front of me is going to anger me. And it's definitely his fault. The cashier is going to anger me. The customer service representative, or lack thereof, is going to anger me. My friend forgetting my birthday is going to anger me. My significant other misunderstanding my motives is going to anger me. And the way to not respond in anger is to walk by the Spirit. It's to take up the sword of the Spirit. So that rather than take that anger and verbal vomit all over you, or let it sit below the surface like a pressure cooker and just continue to build and build and build and build and build. I pull out the sword of Psalm 103, 9 to 10. I set my mind on God and I think about who is God, what is God like, what does God desire, what does he do when I have offended him, and I remember he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our iniquities, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. I pull out the sword of Micah 7, 18. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. And in my mind, I preach that to myself and I slay the temptation to get angry. Tomorrow, somebody in the body, last one, is going to disagree with me. Somebody's going to have a differing opinion than me, have a different perspective. 
a different viewpoint. You ever notice, like, like sometimes the sheer fact that someone has a different opinion than you feels like an attack? And the temptation is going to be to dissent, to divide, maybe even gossip. Can you believe what they said? And the way to not respond with dissensions and divisions is to walk by the Spirit, to take up the sword of the Spirit, so that rather than insist on my own way, rather than insist on my own perspective, rather than insist on my preference, I pull out the sword of Ephesians 4, 3, and I preach to myself, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and I preach that to myself, and I slay the temptation to believe that my way is the best way. But I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh because those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let's pray.